Well, Russia's Luna 25 lander is scheduled to land at the moon's south pole sometime on Monday night. It marks a major step towards the country's ambition of being the first to land there in the search for frozen water. Joining me now live is astrophysicist and cosmologist at ANU, Brad Tucker. Brad, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. So how long yeah. will it spend up there? Yeah, so so the mission kind of is currently scheduled for about a year once they have touched down. Um, so, as you said, it's kind of expected sometime Monday night. It could come into Tuesday. They haven't that, set that exact timeline. And once they were there, there's, there's eight onboard instruments on board this lander um, that will study a variety of ways um, the lunar regolith, the, the moon dirt, essentially. Because, as you said, it's all about trying to measure, study, and quantify how much ice is at the South Pole. This is kind of why there's this new moon race, is that one of the reasons is we think there's a lot of ice contained at the South Pole, that ice can be used for a number of things, human settlements, uh, but also can be separated into hydrogen and oxygen, which often can be used for things like fuel uh, and other energy sources. So it's becoming quite an interesting spot for people to look at. And how important is this mission overall for Russia, particularly uh, for its ambitions in space? Yeah, look, you know, Luna 25 is called 25 because it's the 25th in the, the Moon series missions Russia's had. However, the last one, Luna 24, was in 1976. So it's been almost 50 years since they've had any mission go to the Moon. And we're not talking about people even. We're just talking about rovers and probes and landers. So obviously, Russia wants to ramp up their activity just like the U.S. Uh, and China and India and other countries. So they really need to not only get it right this time, which, you know, they have a lot of expertise, so the likelihood is yes, but really they need to have their, their next timeline of missions that they have planned really go to schedule because this one was massively delayed uh, and they have larger ambitions of setting up activity around the moon. Uh, so really, um, hopefully it's a good sign for a first step for them, but there's a long path forward, I think, to uh, longer activity on the moon that Russia en envisions that they're having. Yeah, just like every other continent, every other place around the world, they want to be the first to do so. So uh, yeah. interesting times ahead. Now, India's aiming to do the same here, Brad, and they've also released uh, the latest images of the moon. Tell us firstly, what do these pictures tell us? Yeah, so so the, the latest images coming out of it are what we've had just in the past day where the lander, the Vikram lander, has separated from the rest of the probe. And so what the Vikram lander has been doing is imaging the craters that it's intended to landing on. So essentially, where are the targets and the ghosts? So these are, um, it's approaching about 30 kilometers right now, the Vikram lander, where it is. So it's orbiting around. Uh, so a lot of this has been testing the cameras that it's going to be using on the surface and then imaging the landing sites that it intends to have as it approaches. So this was all part of essentially the turning on process to make sure that once the lander does start to descend towards the moon, which is currently scheduled for later Wednesday our time, um, that it's all working according to plan and they can identify and adjust their landing relative to anything that comes up on the camera. And it's all about the moon today because a US yeah. company, Intuitive Machines, well, that's also aiming to head to the moon in mid-November. That's right. Intuitive Missions is one of the companies, Intuitive Machines, is one of the companies that NASA has contracted to to land cargo in missions to the lunar surface. They have, as you said, set now their launch window for between the 15th and 20th of November. Uh, as you said, also landing at the lunar south pole with the Indian Chandrayaan 3 mission, which is scheduled for Wednesday in Luna 25. This is kind of where everyone is focused on now, this lunar South Pole. So that's why Russia obviously getting there first is big for them, but there's a lot of groups following in between. And Intuitive Missions, in fact, just one of the companies NASA has contracted has three missions planned. The first one scheduled for, yeah, that 15 to 20 November window, but also a few others in early mid um, 2024 to land there with more experiments in fact the first cargo for the artemis missions these are nasa's return to the moon 
uh, uh, missions for for humans, and it's starting to send the supplies for those as well. So it's getting going to get rapidly busy and crowded uh, at the lunar south pole in the next year. Certainly seems like it. I've got to ask, how difficult is it for these companies to get a NASA contract? Is it competitive? It's very competitive because they're, they're banking on a few different things that the technology they have is going to work, that they can deliver in a time frame that is suitable because if it blows out two, three, four, five years and they miss critical launch windows, then the rest of the missions that, <clears throat> excuse me, NASA's planning uh, get delayed as well. And it's also usually new companies that haven't landed on the moon before or haven't really shown space heritage. So it's really competitive. But to NASA and a lot of these things where it's actually becoming financially viable to spread the budget so that multiple groups can develop technologies and then NASA can focus on some of the harder aspects of the mission has shown to be a really huge success for their exploration goals and kind of why we're seeing this new moon race. Yeah, well, there you go. It certainly is a moon race. Now, Australia has a new piece of equipment, Brad. It's a beamline. What is it and what will it do? So a beamline is essentially a, a small particle accelerator that smashes atoms together to simulate and create very small um, subatomic particles. Now, this is something that's been existing at ANU for 50 years. There's a number of them around the world. But what has been upgraded at ANU uh, is the ability to test particles that are radioactive, essentially the radioactive particles that we get in space that affect spacecraft. So when you launch into space, there's a huge number of environmental issues that affect how your equipment operates. Uh, the vacuum of space affects electronics, the range of temperatures, because space is both very cold, but if you're in front of the sun, it's very hot, but also radiation. And so these can affect the electronics, it can fry the electronics, it can do a number of things um, when these missions are flying. So in order to know that your satellite or equipment's gonna work in space, you wanna put as much rigorous testing as you can before it's launched. Now at Mount Stromlo, we're on base at ANU, we already have the ability to do all of the testing except the radiation testing. And that's what this new beam line is allowing us to do, meaning that Australian companies and, and universities and groups and defense will have all of the testing equipment they need so that once they launch their object into space, they know it's gonna work. Oh, that's great. We'll look forward to seeing uh, how it goes. Just finally, Brad, so an impact crater could possibly be linked to a previous mass extinction event. Tell us about it. That's right. You know, famously, an asteroid uh, we are pretty sure hit the Earth 65, 66 million years ago, created a crater and wiped out the dinosaurs or most of them and most of that's life. But that's not the only one. In fact, on the map here are a number of craters that have been shown from 50 to 100 kilometers on Earth, on Australia rather, that have been previously identified. And a new one, the Delenquin Crater, so New South Wales, um, has been found to be a 520 kilometers. To put that in a scale, that is multiple times bigger than the crater from the one that we think is linked to the dinosaurs, and happened around 445 million years when the Gondwana supercontinent is believed to have broken up. So this may be the connection we have from a massive asteroid hitting the Earth in Australia, creating a mass extinction event previously, because famously as the dinosaurs got wiped out, we've had other periods in life going billions of years back where life has been mostly wiped out previously as well, and then identifying the crater. So it's kind of a big step into understanding that the history of the continents and how it's evolved, the life events that have happened as well, all thanks to a crater that we think happened in Australia during this time period. So there's a little bit more work to do to confirm if this is really the case, but a big step forward in understanding this big part uh, of the history of the world. Wow, that would be amazing if it is confirmed. Brad Tucker, lovely to speak with you as always. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thanks.